premature death from all causes in the modern world. Excess inflammation impairs the function of every organ system in the body and increases the risk of a wide variety of debilitating conditions. There are really two key functions of food. The one that's perhaps most obvious is its fuel, right? So it's just like putting the fuel in the tank of any machine. Food is the fuel, and if you want a high-performance machine, it, it stands to reason that you need to put in high-performance fuel. But the second, and this is not true for any machine other than a living organism, it's also construction material. I think we forget that. So. Hey there, welcome to the Happy Habit Podcast. If you're new around here, my name is Matthew and you'll find me in exactly this place every Monday and Thursday uh, talking to experts on the subjects of health, well-being and self-improvement. If you're already familiar with the podcast and are getting value from any of these episodes, show your support. You can like, subscribe, share with other people who are like-minded who will get uh, value and education from these episodes too. You can also leave us a positive rating, as many of you have done to date on iTunes or on Spotify. And if you're on YouTube, join the growing legion of new subscribers. Be become a subscriber over there. You can click that bell notification for future videos that come every Monday and Thursday. And you can join the conversation by leaving a comment below any of the interviews. Dr. David Katz joins me today. He is a physician, a nutritionist and a writer, having written many books, including Disease Proof and The Truth About Food. In this episode, I ask Dr. Katz what the best diet is according to the scientific evidence. We hear about the most important factor to people's health the world over. We ask what is driving heart disease, cancer and diabetes. I also ask what barriers exist to people eating a diet that optimizes their health. We also discuss the growing amounts of conflicting information related to diet that is available to people and lots more besides. I hope you enjoy. There are so many different ways to consume food today. So many different diets. There's everything from keto to low carb to vegan to paleo to carnivore. What do you believe to be the optimal healthy diet to look like? Well, Matt, great to be with you. Thanks for having me. And and I think an important place to start is it, it's not really about belief. So as as a scientist, I, I have beliefs. I have preferences. I suppose I could even say I have my own ideologies. But I, I do my very best to push all that out of the way when I'm asked about issues that really should be predicated on evidence. And the kind of evidence we have about dietary intake patterns and human health outcomes is overwhelmingly persuasive coming from multiple sources that are complementary to one another. So we have modern randomized intervention trials. We have long-term observational epidemiology. We have insights from paleoanthropology that studied our native dietary intake. And let, let's just digress for a second there. You know, people are maybe skeptical. They, they've heard that the only way to answer a question these days is a randomized controlled trial. Who wants to talk about anthropology? Well, consider the fact that we know the right diet for every species on the planet. You know, we put animals in a zoo, we don't do randomized controlled trials to know what to feed them. We feed them what they were eating in the wild. Every wild animal species knows what to feed itself and they don't conduct meta-analyses. So paleoanthropology is about situating ourselves back in a natural context that says, what is the native diet of Homo sapiens? So we know a lot about that. And of course we have observational information from entire populations over spans of lifetimes and generations. And I'm speaking in particular about the world's five blue zones brought to us by National Geographic fellow Dan Buechner and others. And although that's not any kind of intervention trial, in some ways it's the most definitive kind of evidence of all because these are genetically diverse populations and they have diverse dietary patterns, but they also have a common theme and they all live to 100 routinely, and they all avoid chronic disease, and they all enjoy incredible vitality that, that is the envy of us all. So this isn't really about belief. It's about a lifetime devoted to scrutinizing all the sources of evidence and capturing everything I could find in peer-reviewed papers and textbooks and so forth. And the answer to your question is, the basic theme of optimal eating for the kind of animal we are was captured in seven words by Michael Pollan, eat food, not too much, most plants. And if we unpack that a bit, it means all dietary patterns conducive 
not just a short-term health outcome. So you can do a lot of silly things and lose weight in the short term or, or lower your blood glucose or your lipids in the short term. But we're talking about years in life, life in years, the outcomes that really matter most, longevity, vitality. It's about eating mostly unprocessed or minimally processed vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds, and mostly drinking plain water when thirsty. And as long as you truly mostly do that, Everything at the margins of that is up for debate. And so can you spin that in a direction that includes or excludes meat? Yes. Can you spin that in a direction that includes or excludes fish? Yes. Can you spin that in a direction that includes or excludes dairy? Yes. And round and round we go. Allowing for all of the different dietary variations on the theme of healthful eating, but what's not debatable, what's not negotiable, and what's not about belief, but really is about incontrovertible evidence is that basic theme. You mentioned the blue zones already. It's often held up as the gold standard, that Mediterranean diet, certainly in Sardinia, which is one of the blue zones. Is there any truth in that, do you think, or is it more nuanced, even within the blue zones? Because I know you said there is variation between those five zones. I think it's variation, Matthew. In fact, one of the five blue zones is in Okinawa, Japan, and their diet's nothing remotely like the Mediterranean diet. In fact, most East Asian diets exclude dairy and always have, and they're extremely low in fat, not because anybody's trying to eat a low fat diet, just because the foods that prevail there are natively low in fat. Whereas the Mediterranean diet is famously high in fat. Now, of course, it's good fat. It's mostly unsaturated fat, in particular, monounsaturated fat coming from extra virgin olive oil, olives, avocados, nuts, and seeds, along with polyunsaturated fat. But the Mediterranean diet is actually considerably higher in total fat than the native diet here in the U.S., the prevailing diet here in the U.S., the prevailing diet throughout most of Europe. And um, the, the Okinawan diet is is a fraction of the total fat content, a different distribution of foods. What they have in common, though, is they're both mostly about whole minimally processed plant foods. There was a recent paper I liked very much pointing out that the Mediterranean diet, this is in advances in nutrition, the Mediterranean diet has been most studied and is held up as a paragon of, of health promotion. But that doesn't mean there aren't other cultural diets that are just as good. First of all, there are many variations on the theme of the Mediterranean diet. There's the Western Mediterranean, there's the Eastern Mediterranean. We could be talking about Southern France. We could be talking about Italy. We could be talking about Spain. We could also be talking about Greece, Turkey, North Africa, all these kinds of the Middle East, all these countries border the Mediterranean Sea and have variations on the theme of the Mediterranean diet. So it's it's a dozen different diets, maybe more. And you're right, two of the five blue zones are in the Mediterranean region, Sardinia, Italy, De Korea, Greece. But the other three are not. And the other three are not Mediterranean diets. So there's a vegetarian, vegan dietary pattern that prevails in Loma Linda, California, a low-fat, mostly plant, rice-predominant, omnivorous diet with a fair amount of fish and seafood in Okinawa, Japan, and a diet different from all of those yet again in the Nicoya Peninsula, Costa Rica, where it's an omnivorous diet, again, lots of plants, and a particular um, preference for a native tuber, a, a root vegetable. One of the things that's common to them all is an emphasis on beans and legumes, which are really worth a particular shout out because they're incredibly good for human health. They're rich in a wide variety of micronutrients, very high in fiber, fantastic protein source, great substitute for meat. And they're also really easy on the planet. They're easy to grow. They tend to be drought tolerant. They don't need a lot of water. Uh, so interesting that one of the foods that's best for both personal human health and planetary health is, is perhaps the single most discernible common denominator among the five blue zones. So no, we are not obligated to choose a Mediterranean diet. There are lots of reasons why people might do that. It's a delightful diet. Most people enjoy the food. I mean, for, for many of us, that's a part of the world we happily go to to spend our money uh, to enjoy the food. So the idea that you can love food that loves you back is kind of put front and center with an emphasis on the Mediterranean diet. But there are diets in sub-Saharan Africa that are just as good. There are diets in other parts of Europe that are just as good. There are diets in South America that are just as good. There are diets from the Caribbean that are just as good all around the world. So variations on a common theme puts each of us in charge in our own kitchen. And I think that's where people want to be, right? Because although the commonalities 
of nutritional requirements are shared by all of us. We're all the same kind of animal. We're, we're all one extended human family. You and I are cousins and one or another. We're, we're, we're family. Uh, but our tastes vary and our upbringing varies and, and our cultural exposures vary. And honoring both of those things, I think, is the path to long-term success with food. Well, talking, talking of cake sins, I'm interested to know what your own cake sin looks like. Can it be so bold as to ask what your, your diet consists of? I practice exactly what I preach. Preach. I, I, I eat, have peach too. I like peaches, but um, I eat uh, real food, mostly plants. Uh, I'm vegan most of the time whenever it is practical and reasonable. I don't eat mammals. I, I gave up eating mammals as a kid long before I knew I would go into nutrition or even medicine, um, simply because I, I had dogs and I loved them and I rode horses and I loved them. A couple of times riding out west in the U.S., um, interacting with cattle, I thought, well, gee, there, you know, there's just not that big a difference between the horse I'm riding and the steer over there that's looking me in the eye. I can't call one of these a friend and the other dinner. It just didn't work for me. So, so I haven't eaten red meat and, and mammals uh, pretty much my whole life. I've cut way back on fish and seafood, which I still eat occasionally. Um, I do think that eating fish and seafood is good for people. I just think it's pretty bad for the fish, <laughs> particularly in a world where we're depleting the oceans and, and uh, you know, we're at risk of losing major fisheries and, and doing all sorts of damage to water quality and the planet that's that's imposing additional burdens. I, I would never want to be the guy that eats the world's last wild salmon. I say leave it for, for the Kodiak bears in Alaska. So so occasional fish and seafood. Um, I used to include poultry in my diet. I don't anymore except once a year on Thanksgiving. My, my mother would uh, it would break her heart if I didn't eat her Thanksgiving turkey. So once a year, a free-range turkey. Uh, but I, I eat lots of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds all the time. My breakfast is mixed fruit with whole grain cereal, uh, hot oatmeal in, in cold months, uh, cold whole grain cereal in warmer months, uh, snack on whole grains, nuts, seeds, fresh fruit, dried fruit. Uh, my wife's a fantastic cook, so our dinners are varied, but vegan most of the time when not vegan, vegetarian, and then every now and then fish and seafood throughout in the mix, sustainably sourced. And, and, and people would be curious as to know as to whether you're at a disadvantage from a biomarker standpoint, given your your diet, that you, you, you don't uh, consume animal protein, as you said. So could you talk to me about this? Yeah, uh, I, I'm pretty sure rather the opposite. So I'm 61 years old. I work out uh, hard every day. Um, I, and I, I don't want to seem like I'm singing my own praises. Um, First, to be clear, th this doesn't make me special. Right? I mean, if you're talking to a pilot about how to fly a plane, they can answer all your questions about flying a plane because they have a skill set the rest of us don't have. They're not better people. They're just pilots. Well, I'm a lifestyle medicine expert. So do I know how to get diet right and benefit from it? Yeah, I'm supposed to, and I do. So I have the cardiometabolic health of the active athletic 20-year-old. Uh, I'm 61 years old. Um, I, again, work out hard every day. I'm an equestrian. Uh, I'm out routinely riding horses cross country, jumping over things, uh, doing everything imaginable on horseback. Um, been playing polo over the last couple of years. Uh, hike a few miles routinely with my dogs. You know, just, I can do anything. Uh, very fit, very strong. Um, extremely low body fat, high muscle mass, uh, high strength to weight ratio. Um, and Pretty confident I can do more chin-ups and pull-ups than pretty much anybody listening to me right now. Um, and on and I go, so no, no, you know, it does. I, I'll be honest, you know, at 61, it is harder to hang on to muscle mass than it was when I was 21 or 31 or 41 or even 51. I mean, there are age-related changes we're all subject to, no matter how healthy you are. Even the Blue Zonians eventually do go gentle into that good night, right? I mean, we all have to shuffle off our mortal coil, and along the way. There are changes, and I, you know, I rec at sixty-one, I recognize those changes. Uh, but my metabolic profile is perfect, so my blood pressure is low. It's it's what you'd expect in a healthy person in their twenties. Um, my lipids are extremely low overall, and it's been a while since I last checked. But traditionally, my HDL, the good cholesterol, is as high or higher than the LDL, the bad cholesterol, which is pretty much unheard of. My triglycerides are nil. My glucose metabolism is perfect. My inflammatory cytokines are in the basement. I could keep going. But 
it works. Lifestyle as medicine works. It's incredibly powerful. And and to be clear, it's not just about diet. The exercise I'm describing is really important. Getting enough sleep is important. Managing stress. I, I, sleep and stress, by the way, are my, my two weak links. So we can talk more about that if you want. But I do the best I can. Um, loving relationships. I love my wife. I love my children. I have good friends. Um, I love my dogs and my horses. I, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of my time with creatures I really want to be with. I think that's that's extremely therapeutic. Uh, so I try to, and, and I avoid toxins. Uh, my wife and I enjoy good wine, but don't drink excessively. We've never smoked, uh, no other toxins. So, you know, try to get the lifestyle medicine formula completely right. And it makes an enormous difference. And and the other thing that's worth noting, Matthew, so you asked about me personally, but you know, when, when I go to conferences with my colleagues in lifestyle medicine anywhere in the world, um, including at the major lifestyle medicine conference, which convenes a couple thousand people here in the U.S., you immediately notice the audience looks different than any other group you can be with. The, the BMI is discernibly lower. I mean, everybody everybody looks lean. Everybody looks vital. The energy levels. I mean, you just it's it's almost embarrassing to say. This may be the greatest evidence of all. Convene people who have adopted lifestyle medicine as their calling. And I pretty much guarantee you, you've got a group that on any parameter you care to measure is profoundly healthier than almost any other assembly you can pull together. Uh, it's it, it's stunning. It just it, it jumps right out at you. I mean, people just look vital and vibrant and healthy. And, and you know, there are also people in our tribe in lifestyle medicine, you know, we're still routinely giving talks at major conferences into their 80s and 90s. Uh, and you occasionally see that in other fields, but not much. Um, and they're perfectly sharp and able to answer hard questions. Um, it's it's an anecdote, but it's an anecdote at a scale of thousands. It's pretty impressive. Disease proof, which I'll link in the show notes for this episode, you tackle the risk factors for heart disease, cancer, diabetes. For people who aren't familiar with the book and the contents of the book, what are the drivers of these sources of metabolic dysfunction? The single leading predictor variable for all major chronic disease risk in the modern world is diet quality, overall diet quality. And, and we have objective ways of measuring that. And uh, I'm very focused on that in my day job these days. So uh, I'm involved in uh, a business that's looking to turn diet quality into a vital sign, just the way blood pressure is. Before we had the blood pressure cup, we knew blood pressure was very important, but we didn't measure it in anybody because it was too hard. That's pretty much where we are with diet. We know that diet quality is the single leading predictor for total chronic disease risk and the risk of premature death from all causes in the modern world. So that this this wouldn't necessarily include every country in the world, but every industrialized country in the world. So throughout you know most of the EU and certainly here in the US and the UK, diet quality is number one. So the leading driver of metabolic derangements and the precursors of heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, et cetera, et cetera, would be diet quality, followed by physical activity. And of course, for people who do smoke, you could almost say smoking deserves to be number one. It used to be tobacco was the leading predictor. And the only reason it's not is there's a lot less smoking in the world today. So at the population level, diet quality is number one. In an individual who's smoking, I would say the first order of business would be to stop. Excess alcohol is also a contributor, in particular, to cancer risk, and probably more so in women than men, but ultimately both. So it, the same short list of factors, uh, we talk in, in lifestyle medicine about essentially feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love. That's that's my summary. So feet is physical activity, forks is dietary powder, fingers is not holding tobacco and bringing it to our lips. Sleep, making sure we get enough. Stress, making sure we don't get too much. And love, making sure we have good, healthy, supportive social connections. I'm not talking just about romantic love. I'm talking about friends. Um, that, that, that's the six-cylinder engine of lifestyles medicine. Th those are the key drivers of metabolic health. And it's the same basic pathways that underlie the development of all the major chronic diseases, which is why in Disease Proof and other books I've written since, I'm able to channel the evidence indicating that if you get the lifestyle pattern right, it's a shutoff valve, not just for cardiovascular disease and not just for type 2 diabetes, 
but also for cancer and also for dementia and degenerative arthritis and neurodegenerative disease, non ironic host, because excess inflammation impairs the function of every organ system in the body and increases the risk of a wide variety of debilitating conditions. Excess oxidation injures all the cells in the body. And, and the other thing we should know, if you think about diet in particular, really two key functions of food. The one that's perhaps most obvious is its fuel, right? So it's just like putting the fuel in the tank of any machine, food is the fuel. And if you want a high performance machine, it, it stands to reason that you need to put in high performance fuel. But the second, and this is not true for any machine other than a living organism, it's also construction material. I think we forget that. So your body, my body, and the bodies of everybody listening, every day are burning through resources that need to be replaced. We're talking about the turnover of hundreds of millions of cells. You turn over, your body turns over hundreds of millions of cells every day, and they have to be replaced. Otherwise, you start to fall apart. Well, where are you going to get the material to replace them? Every day, a healthy human body burns through enzymes, which are key metabolic workforce, and they have to be replaced. Every day, we're using up neurotransmitters and hormones and a lot of components of cell biology, biochemistry are sources that essentially get burned up in the process of doing their job and have to be replaced. So where does the replacement material come from? Well, there are really only two places. One, your body could cannibalize itself and say, you know, I'm, I'm basically going to scavenge material from the heart to rebuild the liver or the liver to rebuild the brain or the brain to rebuild the gastrointestinal tract. Well, that's, that's a bad trade-off because you're harming one vital organ to help another. So the body doesn't do that except in desperation, desperation like starvation. In general, the construction material comes from diet. And if you think about building a house or anything else, you know, can you do as good a job if you have an excess of one kind of material, let's say, you know, way too much wood, but not nearly enough nails or screws or way too much plumbing, but not nearly enough electrical wire. And the simple answer is no. You could build something, but you, you couldn't build an intact, well-fabricated, perfectly functioning house. The human body is exactly the same. So provisioning it with the right fuel also means provisioning it with the right construction material in the right distribution, which is why it's so crucial to focus on overall dietary pattern. And it's also the explanation why getting it wrong obviously increases your risk for almost every bad thing that could happen to your body because you're not replenishing cells in an optimal way. You're not replenishing all the enzymes you need. You're not replenishing hormones and neurotransmitters. You're not feeding a healthy microbiome. You could look at all these different pathways and say, by any one of a number of these, we could account for an increased risk of pretty much every bad thing that could happen to someone. So, you know, I, I think at the start of the conversation, Matthew, when, you, when you're pointing out to people how unbelievably important diet is, people actually do find it unbelievable and think, I can't believe that diet's going to affect everything so strongly. At the end of the conversation, you should be saying to yourself, I can't see how it would. It is the fuel that runs every important function a human body has to do, including the work of cells that's going on 24-7 the work of the beating heart, everything, and its construction material into the bargain. How could it not be profoundly important to every imaginable health outcome? And the simple answer is, it is. If diet and quality of diet is so crucial, what do you think or what do you know to be the greatest obstacle to people getting access and consuming a quality diet? The single greatest, particularly for us here today, since you know, we're having a podcast conversation and our audience is people who listen to podcasts. So I'm going to focus on that audience, but I, I am going to quickly know, and, and you're well aware of this, Matthew, that for some people, the greatest barrier to access is simply not having access, right? There, there are still hungry people in the world. There are people prone to famine in the world. There are people who do not listen to podcasts and can't access a podcast and maybe have no internet or smartphone and they can't get enough to eat. So sadly, for, for some of our cousins in the extended human family, the biggest barrier to access is truly no access. It's, it's hunger and famine and all that horrible stuff that still happens in the world. So we can't ignore that. I'm a public health physician. I think about those things all the time. But for you 
And for me and our audience, the single biggest access, access barrier is misinformation. And you, you mentioned disease proof. I've written a lot of books. One of them is called The Truth About Food. And it's 800 pages. It's 200,000 where this, it's my magnum opus. I basically, I needed to do a brain dump just to alleviate the burden and everything I knew about eating well and, and what it is and why it's hard, I, I put it in the book. And I joke in the book that this is a 200,000 word book that should be seven words and they should all be plagiarized. They should be Michael Pollan's words, eat food, not too much, mostly plants, and then say, goodbye, everybody. That's all you really need to know. So what the heck are the other 199,000 993 words, and they're all about why it's so hard. There's massive profit to be made by big food distorting the truth about what's good for us to eat. They can sell us an awful lot of high-profit junk masquerading as food if they confuse us. There's a massive profit for big pharma in treating conditions we never needed to get. The, the, the biggest example these days, of course, is the GLP-1 drugs of Zempic and Wagobi that everybody's talking about. Well, yeah, they're terrific drugs for problems we never needed to get. We routinely ate well and were physically active and, and got the lifestyle formula right. There'd be almost no type 2 diabetes. There'd be almost no obesity. The two things that those drugs are most used to treat would be at a vanishingly low level of population instead of being essentially pandemics. And there is massive profit for media and publishing in confusion and misinformation about food. If you think about it, diet gets talked about in pop culture almost as often as the weather. It's big business. You know, so you mentioned earlier in, in your comments all the different kinds of diets that people have access to. Well, for every one of those kinds of diets, there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of books that are being sold and people are making lots of money off those books. If we were like the Bluzonians who recognize that there really is no news about diet, I mean, after all, what the, the winning formula for people in the blue zones is they pretty much do what their parents and grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents did. They're not watching the morning shows to figure out what should we be eating this week, like the rest of us do. So consequently, morning shows are probably less big a hit there, <laughs> and bad diet books are less big a hit there. And sadly, it may be that as modern culture infiltrates the blue zones, they stop being blue zones. So, you know, there is some risk of that. But the biggest barrier is misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, distortion. And then if we ask the follow-on question to that, why? Why all this misinformation? What's in it for people? Uh, the answer is the usual one, money. Tremendous amounts of money to be made by pseudo-confusion about healthy eating. If we were to get past that massive barrier, are there still additional barriers? Yeah, people are busy. It, you know, they don't they don't have the skill set to prepare food at home. Everybody's forgotten how to do that. They don't know what to shop for. They don't know how to cook. They don't know the right recipes. They don't know how to make their families happy. They don't know how to manage the time required to prepare meals at home. They don't know what to order when they eat out. We can layer things on. It's not all about misinformation, but I'd say that's the first big hill we all need to climb. If we all understood what the fundamentals of a basically health promoting dietary pattern were and rallied around that, it would have a massive impact on the food supply because the single greatest determinant of the food supply is the food demand. Ultimately, the job of business is to keep the customer satisfied. And if we all knew what junk was and didn't want to feed it to our children, they'd stop selling it. So that's the single greatest barrier and everything else is secondary. I was reminded when you were talking about your, your book, The Truth About Food, I was reminded of uh, Professor Marianne Nessel's book, Food Politics. I had her on the podcast last year and she was talking uh, really uh, quite angrily about that uh, cozy relationship that Congress has with food producers in America and about essentially the food consumers being the ones who were suffering because, well, the food producers were not producing any foods that would be considered to be uh, healthy and complement somebody's uh, metabolic health. So just interested to hear your thoughts on that dynamic between, between the food producers and, and governments in the Western world and, and broader. It is broader because misinformation is starting to have an impact on the United Nations, information disseminated as global guidance about dietary selection. There's tremendous lobbying, not just on behalf of ultra processed food, but specifically by the animal food industry where there's lots of money, lots of power. And 
and a shift in the public's inclination as we talk more and more not only about diet for health but diet for planetary health and the, and the environmental impact of foods we choose the, the animal food industry is concerned about losing market share and so they're sort of doubling down on selling messages and cherry picking science to share with organizations like the UN I have all the, the same concerns as Marion um, I think the relationships are very concerning they they occur not just with government but with major authorities like the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which has been called out for this many times, potentially with some of the major medical colleges and professional organizations with the UN, certainly between for-profit entities and media where there's opportunity to sponsor segments on the morning shows and, and obviously buy, use the profit of a product to buy access to the public, which is easier than it ever used to be because of social media and the internet. So getting information out to people uh, can be done very efficiently at low cost now. But if you have resources, you can produce a greater volume than anybody else. And ultimately, we have to all worry that a lie told in our times will start to feel like truth to people. Uh, it's one of the, the, the reasons that propaganda still prevails. So yeah, I'm very concerned about these relationships. I I, I think we get conflict of interest wrong in so many ways. I, I think we police all the wrong things. So if someone honestly says, I do the work that I'm talking about, I, I, I practice what I preach, I put my money, effort, time, blood, sweat, tears where my mouth is, so I don't just talk about doing the right thing. It's my day job too. I don't see that as a conflict of interest. I see that as a confluence of interest. So, you know, I followed the evidence to what I think is the best diet, and now I'm trying to do everything to advance that. That's often policed as a conflict of interest. Well, you can't talk about that at a conference because it's your day job and you're making money from doing it. But you, you, you throw up your hands and say, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it because I know it's the right thing to do. But that's viewed as a conflict. Whereas lots of money changing hands between organizations with specific foods to sell and government entities responsible for dietary guidance at the scale of whole nations is not effectively policed. And we know that we have a real problem here in the US with our dietary guidelines because they're generated by the USDA, the Department of Agriculture. And the USDA is subject to congressional oversight. And Congress is lobbied by all of the big agribusinesses. And we have a two step process for our dietary guidelines. The first is a dietary guideline advisory committee. And that's a group of scientists whose job it is for a period of at least a couple of years to review all the available evidence, and update the guidelines. But the report they produce, the report of the DGAC, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, is just advisory. <laughs> it's, it's the best science, but the best science is viewed as just a suggestion. Because ultimately, the politicians decide, okay, we're we, thank you so much, scientists, pat on the head for doing your job. We're now going to take what you recommended and here's what we're going to recommend, which will include all the things we want to keep from what you recommended, but none of the things we don't. And we're also going to throw in some things to make sure that this is comfortable and cozy for our friends in big agribusiness and big food. Well, complicating the conversation even further because we were already speaking about misinformation and disinformation. And that is the poor quality of medical training as far as nutrition is concerned. But there has been a, a start of a growth in the area of culinary medical training. Could you talk to me about this? I love it. And, and some of my dear friends and close colleagues, Dr. David Eisenberg at Harvard in particular, come to mind, um, are in the vanguard of this effort. And I, I love it because when, when I went to medical school, we had a, a course in biochemistry, and of course, biochemistry involves enzymatic pathways that are fed by nutrients. When you think about essential nutrients, vitamins and minerals, why are they essential? Well, because they they are configured directly into crucial biochemical pathways. So you can't study biochemistry and not learn about nutrients. But we got biochemistry, and it was sort of at the end of that. Okay, you you you've been taught nutrition with. What? I mean, you know, we, we know nothing, whatever, about what we should eat, let alone what we should tell patients. But that was nutrition back in the day. They actually thought, okay, we taught the, these guys biochemistry. They're nutrition experts. 
and and that sadly, you know, medicine has been parked there for a very long time, and it's a big part of the reason why most physicians have nothing useful to say about food to their patients. Culinary medicine is a complete one hundred and eighty, and says let let's teach medical students how to make a healthy meal because they need one. <laughs> they're they're busy, hardworking people. Um, they need to know how to eat well, so they actually can not just work on other people's health, but maybe even be healthy themselves, there's a radical idea. You know, basically look after yourself and others. I like that. Um, but the idea is, okay, so we're going to teach you all how to cook and, you know, we're going to focus on all the things that matter, making it nutritious, making it convenient, making it affordable, making it delightful. And you can pay it forward because, you know, when we're done, here's here's the recipe card. Carry this with you, share it with you, hand it out to your patients. You're not the only one who can benefit from this meal. I love it. I mean, everything about it is, is so pragmatic. I, I, I long referred to myself as a pub, public health pragmatist that, you know, we shouldn't make perfect the enemy of good. We shouldn't bog down in the theoretical at the expense of practical ultimately a difference to be a difference must make a difference. So let's focus on differences we can actually make for the good in people's lives. Uh, you know, being able to recite the numerous pathways from biochemistry has never helped a patient. Telling them here's a great recipe for a delightful, convenient, portable, really nutritious family meal you can make tonight has. So I, I love it. I think culinary medicine is just the way to go. I have to recommend uh, your 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 books, and uh, what I will do is I will stick a link to uh, Disease Proof and the Truth About Food in the show notes for this episode. And if people want to find out more about you and uh, and the work that you do and uh, Diet ID, which I know you're involved with, that you mentioned at the outset of this discussion, where can people go to online? And before that, I'll get to that in just a second, Matthew. But one other link, um, since we're talking about culinary medicine and giving people practical tools. I, I'm going to shout out my wife's recipe site, quizinicity.com. Uh, so my wife, Catherine, is a PhD in neuroscience, but more importantly for this discussion, mother of five, we raised to adulthood and we practice what we preach is discuss and eat optimally. She's a fantastic cook, but used her scientific acumen, and she's French, by the way, to, to look at great recipes and think, what can I do to keep them great? And make them great nutrition too. So delicious and nutritious. How do I combine? So just, you know, decades of work in the Katz family kitchen, optimizing the confluence of delicious and nutritious. And then our kids talked her into paying it forward. Put all that on a website, put videos of you cooking to show people how to do it, make it easy, make it accessible, make it delightful. It's all free. Quizinicity.com. So like Cuisine City, but with an I in the middle. Quizinicity. Cuisine meets simplicity.com. So everybody help yourselves. There's culinary medicine right there for you. Uh, and then, sure, at, at Diet ID, so we're working to make diet quality a vital sign. As mentioned, it's the leading predictor variable for premature death, for chronic disease. We ought to be measuring it in everybody and addressing it in everybody, just the way we do blood pressure. And we've invented a way to assess diet that can take as little as 60 seconds. It's easy. It's fun. It's accurate. It's reliable. It's scalable. So that's our mission to make diet follow the vital sign and then to infuse that power into food as medicine programming so that we can measure where people are at baseline, determine where they need to go to, for their specific health objectives and track their progress and help them get there from here with digital coaching, human coaching and delivering meals to their homes when that's what we need to do. So you can learn more about all that good stuff at dietid.com and uh, that's that's my particular focus these days. The one other thing to note is the True Health Initiative. That's a nonprofit organization I started, and it's very much in line with the conversation we're having, Matthew. So I didn't want people to think that this is all about one person's belief about nutrition. Very much the opposite. It's about evidence. It's about a, a consistent pattern in the peer-reviewed literature. It's about what the science says. It's about putting epidemiology ahead of ideology. And so the True Health Initiative is close to 500 leading experts from 50 countries whose own diets range from paleo and low carb and maybe even keto to vegan, but all of whom agree about the fundamentals of a healthy diet for people and planet all coming together to say, we agree. I think that's a really important resource. So people can learn more about all that at truehealthinitiative.org. And I'll pop a link to that website in the show notes too. 
Uh, Dr. David Katz, a joy to speak with you today. Such an important conversation. Thank you for taking the time. Well, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Happy Habit Podcast. If you enjoyed it or any of the previous over 400 episodes in the Happy Habit Archive, well then show your support. Like, subscribe, share with other people, email them, text them, WhatsApp them, let them know about this podcast because they may find value in it too. You can also leave us a positive rating on iTunes or on Spotify. And if you're on YouTube, become a subscriber over there. We've seen a 50% increase in the number of subscribers in recent weeks, which is terrific. You can also leave a comment under any of the videos on YouTube and click that bell notification for any future videos. Until next time, stay happy.